Cloudflare is well known for its content delivery network and protecting websites from denial of service attacks. The reason we're so effective at this, mainly our globally available high performance network, is also the reason we can deliver powerful zero trust functionality to the enterprise. We built zero trust solutions to help companies protect their employees when accessing the internet and corporate applications. These capabilities allow a business to protect their brand, their employees, and their supply chain. And this short demo walks through these common use cases showing how Cloudflare products work. To protect employees, we first start with their identities. We need to know who they are. Cloudflare integrates with your existing enterprise identity providers, as well as popular consumer identity providers to give you full flexibility in controlling who has access to what. Here, you can see a list of all the supported identity providers. If we don't support a specific identity provider you have, we support SAML and OpenID Connect, allowing you to onboard pretty much any modern authentication provider. Once we've verified the employee's identity, we need to look at their device they're using to access applications. With our device client, Cloudflare Warp, we can determine what's going on with the device. For example, is it joined to the domain? Does it have disk encryption? What operating system is it running? And here, in the larger list of device posture elements the client looks for, we see that we can also support endpoint clients like Sentinel-1, Tanium, CrowdStrike, and Carbon Black. Outside the context of our device client, Cloudflare Zero Trust also supports API integrations with common security providers. You can see we have CrowdStrike Falcon configured here, and we're pulling the trust assessment scores from employees' devices, which we can then use to determine whether employees can access certain applications. Now that we've confirmed the employee's identity and device posture, we can secure their access to business applications. When you onboard applications to Cloudflare, you'll use our application connector, Cloudflare Tunnel, to proxy traffic from the origin server to our edge, essentially turning Cloudflare into your new corporate network. Let's take a look at application setup, starting with Cloudflare Tunnel. As you can see, I have a number of servers connected via Cloudflare Tunnel, which is based on WireGuard and only requires a lightweight daemon with minimal setup. We support Windows, Mac, Linux, and can deploy Tunnel even as a Docker image. When I select my OS, it generates a pre-baked command that I apply to my origin server that then connects it to my network. Once that's set up, I can associate public host names to each service that I want to proxy, and Cloudflare handles server config and DNS record modifications on its own. In this example, we can see I'm hosting multiple applications on non-standard ports, but when users access these applications over Cloudflare Tunnel, the only traffic visible from the outside will be port 80 and 443. If you don't want to use public host names, you can also proxy private IP addresses over your Cloudflare network. Once your app connector is set up, you can now onboard applications and define secure access to your users. I'm taking a look at the company intranet application, and here we can see the IDPs I configured earlier come into play. Of course, we have employee identities in Okta, but we're also allowing people to authenticate via GitHub and something called one-time pin, where they authenticate with their email address and a short-lived password. Let's take a look at the policy that defines employee access. Here, you can see we've assigned this policy to a group called employees, which we've defined from group names in our corporate Okta. You can also see we've added several requirements, one for Okta and another enforcing the use of Cloudflare Gateway. This means for all users matching this policy, all the traffic from the user has to be on-ramped to Cloudflare's network via their device client or some other means before it'll be permitted through. Now let's take a look at the other policy we have for contractor access. Again, we're using the group contractors here, which defines anybody who's in the Okta group contractors, but also we're putting extra information in because we're letting people authenticate using a one-time pin. So we're accepting emails from KPMG, Wipro, or Bulling Rosen here. And again, we're enforcing the use of Cloudflare Gateway before they get access. Before we try to log in, I'm gonna point out that I don't have any connectivity to Cloudflare's Edge because my device client's turned off. Since I don't meet the gateway requirement in the policy, I don't even get the option to log in when I try and access the site. Once I pass the device posture check, I can try to log in. And since I'm an employee, I'm gonna click on Okta and go through an Okta authentication flow and log in. Currently, we're acting as Alice, an IT administrator for my organization. Let's navigate to the Cloudflare app launcher, which will display a contextual list of all the applications Alice can access. As an administrator, she needs to go to work on a database, so we'll select the Postgres admin interface icon. The policy for this app requires all authenticated sessions come with a purpose justification, which Alice here is filling out before she can get access. In another scenario, Alice the IT admin needs to access one of the backend servers over SSH. 
Cloudflare Tunnel works with web-based applications, but it also works with non-web applications too. I'm typing in ssh.skyflash.co and Alice is granted access to a browser-based SSH terminal with minimal security overhead for things like key management and without the inconvenience of starting from a command prompt or other terminal. You can also see the performance of our client is just as fast as it would be if you sat locally on the machine. Finally, Alice is going to take a look at a domain controller, which isn't mapped to a host name. Instead, I'm proxying the private IP address over Tunnel and controlling access via Cloudflare. This private IP address has an access policy on top of it as well, allowing me to secure access directly to the resource rather than the subnet it exists on. This aspect of zero trust network access helps me maintain a granular control over my sensitive infrastructure without too much technical overhead. So what we've demonstrated here is how Cloudflare secures access to a lot of application types that IT and end users rely on. But I wanna point out that this demo has focused on requests coming from users into applications that you host. Let's take a look at our gateway product where you can define policies that secure traffic leaving an end user's machine. As you can see, we can apply these policies at the DNS level, the network level, or at the browser HTTP request level. The first policy we're looking at involves securing sensitive data in motion. And we're looking at it through our expression-based policy builder. This policy is using our DLP profiles to identify financial information or things like social security numbers and tax identifiers in any content. And we're applying those DLP policies to sites hosted by Skyflash but also to our instance of Salesforce as identified with force.com and salesforce.com. Another expression in this policy is looking for financial information again, but this time for data transferring up to cloud storage and applications like Discord, OneDrive, Box, and Dropbox. The last piece of the policy is excluding anyone in the sales or executive groups because they're trusted with customer data. As you can see from the policy action, anyone else who tries this will have their attempt blocked. Let's try and download customer data as Alice. We're starting from Okta, which is where Alice is authenticating from, and clicking on our Salesforce icon. Alice accesses Salesforce and then looks at an opportunity record for the company. Now, when we click on this record, Salesforce can't preview it, but if we try to download it, as that comes across the network, we'll see the download URL blocked. Now, let's take a look at blocking high-risk websites. This is a straightforward policy I've created in the builder that applies to any site that falls into one of these security risk categories, whether that's DNS tunneling, spyware, spam, and it'll also trigger on other content policies for things like hacking and gambling and so on. Any traffic match on a site like this will trigger an identical block page to the one we've just seen. So let's take a look at this in action. I'm gonna try and head to poker.com and have the Skyflash unauthorized access page with an explanation as to why we can't visit that site. But there are cases where you want to allow people to access websites, but those websites may inherently have some form of risk to anyone visiting them. So what we can do is something called remote browser isolation. We have a rule here that applies to any social media website. And we're going to permit user access to this site, but we're going to isolate their web session. What this means is the employee's native browser will never interact with the site being isolated. Instead, Cloudflare is going to spin up a headless Chromium browser at its edge that browses the web page and transmits the page content and user interactions back and forth between the two. That means that whatever happens during the web session, like if they open a suspicious link or activate something malicious, the native browser will remain untouched. You can continue to secure the web session with data protection controls that we apply on top of the isolated browser. This applies to user interactions like printing and copy paste as a means of protecting sensitive information from untrusted sources. For example, we could set this policy to apply to users who log in from a strange geolocation or who don't meet a specific CrowdStrike score. So now let's take a quick look at Twitter. You'll notice from the end user's perspective, nothing seems to have changed. However, all the content that you're seeing is actually being rendered remotely on a server and then delivered to my client using Skia draw commands from the Chromium browser, which is a very low latency, low impact way to transmit web session content. I'm gonna pull up the browser isolation toolbar, and this gives me live metrics of how quickly the headless Chromium browser is communicating with my native device. Cloudflare's unique network vector rendering method allows it to be more performant than traditional methods of browser isolation, like pixel pushing and page scrubbing. And thanks to its single pass architecture and global edge network, it can deliver isolated browsers on the scale of what an enterprise needs. Now I'm going to try and copy some of this content and we can see Cloudflare inform us that it prevented that action. 
I also can't print this page. As we can see from the policy, I can't upload or download files either. Browser isolation is a powerful method to protect users from internet-borne threats, to protect sensitive data from unauthorized use, and protect organizations from zero-day threats. It might be a link that your employee has clicked in a phishing email or something that they've downloaded, but it renders remotely on our server edge and gets torn down when they close the tab. The last policy we'll demonstrate is tenant control. We're going to make sure that employees can only access approved instances of SaaS applications. On the left, we have a policy which is identifying any traffic that's going to Google Workspace or Gmail, and we've added an expression matching this rule to users identified as employees. The action here is allow, but we've added an HTTP header into the request. Now this header is part of something that Google provides, and we can explicitly define which email domains that Skyflash users can access. So on the right, Alice is going to sign into her official skyflash.co Gmail account so she can read a corporate Gmail. But if we switch here to her personal Gmail account, Alice Loves Bees, she doesn't have access. So with this tenant control policy, Cloudflare helps you control access to specific tenants of downstream SaaS apps. And these custom headers are supported by many common SaaS applications in use in the workplace today. The next area of our enterprise security solution we're looking at is something called a Cloud Access Security Broker, or CASB. Here, we can integrate Cloudflare with our existing SaaS applications and have it scan our environment for misconfigurations or sensitive data at rest. In the integrations pane, you can see we've got Atlassian products, Salesforce, GitHub, Slack, and Google currently configured. And setting up your SaaS app inside Cloudflare's API CASB is very simple. When you select your application, we'll indicate what kind of findings or risks we'll be looking for, like administrators who don't have two-factor authentication enabled. Afterwards, we'll direct users to an on-Rails configuration where they'll enable the appropriate service accounts and APIs. And with each integration, Cloudflare talks to the APIs of those services and reports whatever security risks it finds. Inside findings, we can see things like active third-party apps with Jira access, and we've also found files that are being shared publicly which contain sensitive information. We've seen DLP inside gateway policies, but those DLP profiles can also be applied to CASB so we can look for, say, customer sensitive data with public sharing rights. When there is an instance like this one we're looking at now, we can go through the finding and remediation steps to look at what account it is, where it appeared, and what actions need to be taken to resolve it. The value here is that your security team won't need to waste cycles on performing these checks manually, allowing them to focus on preventative and corrective measures where they're most needed. And on the subject of DLP, let's take a quick look at DLP profile configuration. Inside the DLP section, you can see we have some pre-configured dictionaries for you, like financial information, where we look at different types of credit card numbers. You can also create your own custom policies, where you can add your own entries that define what you're looking for by using regular expressions, and again, these profiles can be used either in gateway rules, where you're looking at content moving to and from the browser, or inside CASB integrations, where you're looking for content that matches those DLP rules inside SaaS applications. In other words, both data in motion and data at rest. Now let's look at analytics and logs. Users like having visibility over the security suite to see what's happening. So at a high level, we have access and gateway analytics that help you look at things like failed logins within a specific time period, or shadow IT that your users may be accessing. We pull HTTP headers from the user's traffic that identifies applications that need to be reviewed, allowing administrators to make informed decisions about what's occurring on their network. Inside logs, we can see Cloudflare has recorded every access request to the system, and we can actually look at some granular details as to why some of these actions occurred. Here, we have Alice getting denied access to the PG admin database, and we can dig into how that access policy applied to her specific request because maybe she wasn't in the right group, or maybe she didn't use the right two-factor authentication method. That's a great troubleshooting tool for IT support to help users understand why they're not getting the proper access to their resources. We also have the same sort of logs before our gateway product, which is looking at all of the outbound activity from users. And if we filter out the block requests, we can see when Alice tried to download files from Salesforce. We'll also see the DLP policies, which match to that specific request, and the actual file that was evolved in the block event. Now, a lot of organizations already have places where they're sending and analyzing this data. So Cloudflare supports the ability to push all of our logs from each of our services to a third-party service. You can see here we've got Sumo Logic set up with our own account, but you can push these logs to a variety of external services. And if we don't have a specific integration you're looking for, anything that's compatible with S3 storage will work. 
Finally, let's take a look at how Cloudflare handles email security. Cloudflare recognizes that one of the big vectors for internet-borne threats is employees' inboxes. Cloudflare's Area 1 security sits in front of your email services, deployed either in line by being the MX record for a domain or behind your existing security solution via an API, allowing security administrators absolute control over email traffic headed to their organization. Area 1 focuses on advanced protection against various email threats like phishing, malware, credential harvesting, business email compromise, spam, bulk mail, and, and more. Its approach to email security involves preempting attackers by utilizing sensors, web crawlers, and machine learning models to gain insights into potential threats before they impact you. Through its unparalleled detection and analysis models, Area 1 can hone in on whatever hostile campaigns are present, such that when the candidate gets pointed at you, you can protect your users and effectively keep your inboxes as clean as possible without creating a significant delay in traffic. From the Mission Control dashboard, we can break down email detections by disposition, including malicious, spam, bulk, spoof, and suspicious detections. For domain proximity detection, Area 1 crawls the web for registered domains that are similar to yours and lets you know that someone's trying to impersonate you. But now let's dive into specific emails that Area 1 was able to prevent. Inside the detection submenu, I'll click on the suspicious category, and it'll provide a list view of all the suspicious attachments that have been aimed at my organization. If I select view detection, I'm given the results of Area 1's granular analysis. And in this segment, we can see detailed information about the attachment or the risk and a screenshot of the malicious email, as well as information about the threats identified. The screenshot feature is designed to prevent users from accidentally clicking on malicious links but I can also see who received this across my organization in case I need to perform an individual security checkup later. There's also a very powerful integration with Area 1 and the Cloudflare Remote Browser Isolation technology we were looking at earlier, where suspicious links inside emails are replaced with redirects to an isolated browser, rendering them entirely harmless to people who might not remember their security training. 